Okay, so I just wanted to clarify because there's been a lot of changes as to where we would be located. Um, but for those of you who may not know, we, this is the hashtag Me Too uh, cultural movement panel. Um, so if you were looking to sit in on an, another panel, this would be also a great opportunity for you to move to the, the correct room. <laughs> Okay, so just because I am very aware of the time, I would like to um, get started. Um, again, this is the hashtag Me Too panel, and um, my name is Sonmin Bong, and I am the volunteer and educational outreach coordinator at Wave of Rape Crisis Center. And I feel very, very honored and excited, thrilled, whatever other adjectives you can find, um, to be hosting and facilitating this panel. Um, I'm going to start us off by reading um, every panelist bios um, and then we will I will give a little bit of context around um, hashtag me too movement and then we'll get started <clears throat> okay so I'm gonna start with Jamie Lee Hamilton um, Jamie Lee Hamilton was born and raised in Vancouver in Strathcona Grandview Woodlands and has lived her entire life here Jamie Lee is a co-founder with Becky Ross of the West End Sex Workers Memorial the first ever memorial for sex workers in Canada, and only one of six in the world. Jamie Lee is a strong advocate for the rights of transgender, sex workers, and two-spirit people. Jamie Lee is the co-recipient of uh, winner of the Angus Reid Canadian Sociological Award that was just um, awarded on June 4th. Congratulations, Jamie. And Jamie Lee testified at the National Missing and Murdered Women and Girls Commission of Inquiry and Opal Commission of Inquiry, known infamously for dropping 67 pairs of stiletto shoes on the steps of the city hall to draw attention to the downtown east side missing and murdered women. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Currently, Jamie Lee enjoys semi-retirement, um, but to keep busy planning and organizing sexual and gender justice community events like this one. <laughs> uh, Leah Horlick. Uh, Leah is a writer who grew up as a settler on Treaty 6 Cree territory and the homelands of the Métis in Saskatoon. Her first collection of poetry, Riot Lung, was shortlisted for a 2013 Relit Award and a Saskatchewan um, Book Award. In 2016, she was awarded the Dane Ogilev Prize, uh, Canada's only award for LGBT writers. Her second book, For Your Own Good, which addresses the issues of woman-to-woman -woman sexual assault and domestic abuse in queer and lesbian communities, was recognized with a Stonewall honor from the American Lib Library Association. Last year, her poem, You Were My Hiding Place, which explores the inter intergenerational effects of sexual violence and his historic anti-Semitism, was named Art Poetry Magazine's Poem of the Year. She currently lives on unceded Coast Salish territories in Vancouver. And Daily Lang. Uh, Daily Lang is a white, chronically ill, non-binary trans survivor offering accessible, anti-oppression informed supports for individuals, groups, and organizations seeking to reduce suffering while creating more meaningful, engaged, and aligned futures. You can find more info about their work at fireseedfacilitation.org. Welcome. So before we uh, jump into some of the qu questions that we have prepared, um, I just wanted to give a brief context to what we're talking about today. So as many of you in this room know that hashtag Me Too movement really started to take off in the late 2017 with some of the high profile Hollywood actors coming forward. Having said that, we know that although hashtag Me Too movement may seem like a new movement, um, Me Too movement was something that was founded by Tarana Burke, a black feminist in the States, um, who have been doing this work to raise awareness about sexualized violence in all of our communities for a long time. 
And not only that particular Me Too movement, but the movement to end sexualized violence is really not a new movement, as many, as all of the feminists sitting here are, are very much well aware. Um, so I wanted to really um, host this conversation to talk more about then what has been maybe different about this particular movement, um, what's been some of the new learnings or not so new learnings, and really to include and highlight the voices of uh, folks from communities that were not necessarily best represented uh, in the Me Too movement. So without further ado, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, pose the first question that we prepared, which is, how has the hashtag MeToo movement impacted you and your community or the community that you work with? And anyone can start first. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on unceded coast Salish uh, territory, the home territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And, you know, I believe we're broadening our circles continuously, and that's a really uh, important aspect to all of the work that we do and will continue to do, and me too. I like to use the term us too as well, and so let's keep fighting. Thank you. Um, hi, um, Daily. if you missed it in the intro. Um, I think to premise it with two sort of components, I am always cautious to speak for my community um, because they're, I'm just, I can't capture the diversity of like the people that I'm connected to. And so I'd rather speak from my own experience and see that it resonates with people in certain ways, but always be open to like, that is not the truth, it's just a reality. It's not the truth with the T. And I think second of all, when I'm thinking about Me Too, I think you already pointed to it, but to really clarify that I'm not, I'm responding to what I see as mainstream Me Too, not necessarily Tarana Burke's work, for sure. Um, because I'm about to say, when I was asked to be on this panel, I was like, I have no relationship to Me Too, um, but I shouldn't have, or like the relationship to Tarana Burke's work makes sense that it's not my community and it's not something I have a relationship to. Um, but yeah, for me, being asked to be on this panel, I was like, whoa, why? Um, as a like disabled, mad um, trans person, I really don't have an affinity with that sort of mainstream Me Too movement. Um, I think in part because it demands a certain story um, and it's a story that I can't tell um, and I'm openly a survivor. I'm a survivor of childhood violence and adult. Um, but as a non-binary person, I don't really fit the story of women experiencing harm. And actually the perpetuation of that story being told as the only story actually harms me. Um, I think also as a disabled person, there's really not a lot of space for our people in these conversations. Um, I think even more so with the like deep sanism of storytelling that goes around it. Um, and what I mean by that, um, like even preparing today, I made notes and I like rehearsed for hours because I'm so nervous that my neurodivergent brain isn't going to communicate with you in a way that you're going to think is valid. And that I'm going to tell my story and you're not going to believe me because I'm crazy. And like I self-identify as a banana head. And like you'll notice like I'll just hit the wall and not be able to talk. Or, you know, as I say, like I can find the hallway, but I can't find the door when it comes to language. And so I think that's a huge part of like who gets to be acknowledged across a lot of different um, spectrums, but even like who can tell a coherent story, um, who doesn't dissociate while they're telling their story. Of course I effing dissociate when I talk about it. Like that's what my body does to care for me and I'm really proud that I know how to care for myself. Um, and I think on top of that, it does, Me Too really doesn't resonate because it's talking about interpersonal violence and it often wants to talk about that there's a a victim and a perpetrator. Um, and so much of the harm that I experience, I can't point at someone 
Um, and so I often feel like it's not asked to the table and it's people also aren't asked to account for those kind of harms, you know, like I just think of not to bring this yucky person into the room, but with like Kavanaugh, which was a big shiny moment for me too, where he wasn't allowed, they didn't want him to be a Supreme Court judge because he had assaulted someone, but he is also explicitly anti-refugee, like anti-healthcare, anti-disability, like why aren't those anything that he could be called to account for that would make him not worthy of being, making decisions for a nation? And so for me, I think that sense of like, my gender isn't representation, represent, represented, my brain and my body aren't, and also like the like, limiting stories we can have, like the me too versus us too. I need to say us too, you know? And so I think that's really made me feel a distance from it. Uh, I wanna echo, how about now? Yeah, is that working? Great. Um, I'm grateful to Sonman for all the organizing you work you put into today, and it's a real privilege to be speaking with um, Daly and also with Jamie Lee. How's that volume level now? Any better? Better? How about now? <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Keep giving me thumbs up if I'm too quiet. Um, I don't want to add too much more other than to echo what Daly mentioned about being very cautious about speaking with any kind of generalization today. I can only really speak to my own experience and what I hear from people who've been generous enough to let me know that they share that experience. Um, and for me, what that looks like uh, on a a level of seeing every day on the news people talking about a social movement that is supposed to represent a story that I'm regularly associated with but not actually a part of is quite difficult. Um, I'm lucky to be part of a very, very quiet network of women who have been sexually assaulted by other women in an intimate partner context. So not women who have been sexually abused by their parents, um, but women who have experienced rape and sexual assault committed by other women and queer people in the queer community. Um, um, and it's been very difficult to see narratives of like hegemonic and epidemic male violence against particular women's bodies. We're speaking almost exclusively of cis women with the Me Too movement. Um, and it's just debilitating, I think, for um, women who have a very contested relationship to that identity, um, whether you're femme, whether you're a trans woman, um, who might also identify as femme, it's very challenging to see this story be tacked on to your gender identity without it actually being a shared experience. And I know for myself, I kind of missed the Me Too wave when I started doing this work about abuse and uh, sexual assault in queer communities, and I feel very lucky about that because I think it would have been extra exhausting to have commenced that work right now. Um, the amount of time that I spend managing other people's disgust when I try to talk about women who perpetrate sexual violence against other women is very, very taxing. So to have to enter that dialogue at this particular time would be pretty debilitating. So I feel lucky to have had what, what I now recognize is a gentle start to that conversation, even though there's not much about 2008, 2009 that was gentle in Saskatchewan. Um, but it's something that I feel oddly fortunate about now because I think I've had time to prepare for how this conversation would exclude people I share community with um, rather than to have my hopes set up and to be um, disappointed by that. I can manage my expectations about where, where this dialogue includes us and where it doesn't. Thank you. Jamie, is there anything that you would like to add to what's been said? <clears throat> Yeah. Um, uh, if I can, just for a moment, you know, when I um, was doing some of my early activist uh, actions, and and I remember um, in the '90s and. Um, there wasn't many people that would uh, recognize that there was a serial killer preying on our indigenous women here in the downtown east side. And I just want to center someone out because uh, she was a great friend of my mom's and she's here today. And that's Joan Morelli sitting right here. And Joan uh, took part in some actions with me 
where we were all alone. And so it, you only need one or two people to create the us two. And, uh, and so I just wanted to add that and recognize Joan as well, an elder here. Thank you. And I think it's been really clear just from what all three of you have shared that, you know, we know that um, survivors are already really not believed, but when they um, also experience uh, additional and other intersecting, intersecting marginalization, that it's even less likely that their stories will be believed and have to be told in such a particular way. You know, Jamie, even when you're pointing out about a serial killer like there were indigenous women who were saying that this is happening and it's real but they weren't believed even at that time and you know we know often um, queer women are not believed when they come forward and said they have experienced sexualized violence by other women um, and and you know just that uh, narrative around like having to tell a story that's coherent um, that that's you know we know from also um, serving our community you know through the 24 hour crisis lines or counseling that that's that's so common that you know unless you tell your story in this particular way it just won't be it won't be heard and won't be believed right so thank you for really um, also highlighting that and how that's impacted you um, and your communities um, so just kind of continuing on with that conversation, how have the voices of survivors in your community been reflected in this movement? Um, what has the movement meant for people who have experienced sexual harm in your community or the community that you work with? Sure, I can, I can get this part started. I think... Um, you know, further to what I was saying before, watching the um, the ripple effect of continued exclusion for queer sexual violence survivors uh, has been really difficult. And I think the piece for me that stands out the most is um, watching how queer survivors in particular get erased or used as a punchline. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the Nimrod Reitman case with Avital Ronell. I don't know if any of you are familiar. It's the only time I've been contacted by media to speak about the Me Too movement because someone wanted an insider. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know if it was a compliment. Um, but if you are curious, I recommend you take a look at the media coverage, particularly the New Yorker article by Masha Gessen where they go, oh, what could we possibly do with this situation where we think a lesbian has sexually assaulted a gay man? Hmm, what an interesting legal question. Um, and I don't know if any of you remember the Jezebel forums, which were a dark, dark place. <laughs> don't look them up. But I remember being the subject of so much of that discussion when I first started talking about my experience on the internet. Um, this was back in the time before Google Alerts, when you had to actually Google yourself like once every couple of weeks and hold someone's hand to see what would turn up. Um, and watching people go, well, what if this happened to Leah? What if this happened to Leah? And seeing like detailed description of like, like hypothetical uh, experiences that people would like imagine my body going through was very damaging. Um, and seeing that now happen to, um, I think, to queer survivors of sexual violence in the media, uh, seeing uh, men who are survivors of sexual violence um, in particular as well be treated as like this interesting quandary or kind of a lab rat situation um, has been really, really damaging. And I think it adds an extra layer of silence onto the um, the stigma that we already face as queer survivors when you're already in a very, very small community, um, you often don't have the opportunity to speak about your experience in a way that's safe, um, that won't result in total social isolation or get very, very, very messy. Um, and I think the other thing that's challenging too is um, noticing where we see people talking about what's possible as far as how many experiences of sexual assault you can have in a lifetime is very challenging. Like it's one thing that only happens to you once. I don't know anyone who has only experienced one incident of sexual violence, in particular if you're a woman of color. So seeing how, um, I mean, I'm thinking of Ellen Page, right, who is a queer survivor of sexual harassment, who spoke very, very publicly as far as Me Too. And I don't want to speak in a way that would exclude her from acknowledging that experience because so many queers and trans people have experienced this like hegemonic mass, um, 
like experience of violence perpetrated by men, but that doesn't also mean we aren't at risk in our own communities. So just seeing the ways that those um, experiences are limited, like you only get one and this is where it's going to happen. And if, if you've had more than one experience, something is really wrong with you has been really challenging. I feel like I touched on it in my first response. Um, and I'm gonna use my notes because my brain is sounds like a fax machine right now. If anyone remembers those, I won't do it into the mic because it's mean. Um, but yeah, I think for me, I just don't find that the people that I'm connected to have connected to Me Too as a movement for them. And that I don't think that that doesn't matter. But I think that there's just so much risk. And I think of like the analogous, like telling queer folks that we need to be out um, and that you need to like, if you out yourself, you're gonna have a better life um, without actually changing any of the systems that you're outing yourself to. Um, and sometimes not being out is really safer. Um, not that it's good or what we want, but I think to tell people that the onus is to out yourself as a survivor with out saying without a recognition of how much violence survivors experience and how people at different intersections have more risks involved in being out like even with the trans community like we're not going to pretend that like feminists are gung-ho about us like we're just having conversations about abortions right now and people are swinging at us when i say like abortion matters to me and they're telling me that I'm delusional and that I'm a woman. I'm not a woman, you know? And so like for me to tell survivors that they need to come out and come out to a community that is notoriously violent towards them, that doesn't, like I, I don't know what I'm offering them. And I think for me, I also think of Me Too as very much about coming out to people not in your community. And I wanna be clear about that. I think it's important to find ways that we connect to each other and that we feel safety in telling our stories with each other. And I am a huge critic of the state needing to know my story. Like even legally changing my name, I changed it to not my real name because I didn't want them to have my real name. Like that kind of, it sounds intense, but the sense of like, I'm not, that's not where I find safety, and that's not where I'm gonna ask my friends, my family, the people I work with to seek safety in. Um, yeah. Um, Daly, I, I remember when we were just initially connecting about this panel, we started kind of like talking about that double coming out, right? And that often like queer folks are asked to like, do it, do it, do it. It will be so much better. Your life will change. Everyone will accept you. And, and that um, kind of running parallel with also like survivors really being told like, you know, for the movement, come forward and say, um, and, and, and share your experiences Sexual, sexualized violence and I remember really like during that time and of course Waven never like expected that Me Too would happen it just it just happened and and we had to go with that right and um, you know a lot of people like a lot of survivors um, calling and sharing about how they're being asked to like come out and share it in, uh, with their community and at the same time immediately experiencing like being shunned out by their community by coming forward about um, sexualized violence that's happening. So even though like Me Too may be new, it's like we've all been having conversations about how sexualized violence touches all of our lives. Um, so I think that it's just really important to talk about like if we're gonna ask survivors to come forward, like what is the system that's in place to actually like provide support to survivors um, and yeah, and ensure that um, they're being heard and not actually being further harmed by having f come forward in the community, right? Yeah. Um, good question and, uh, and statement. And I think, you know, uh, for me personally as well, hailing from the trans community, the trans women's community, if we talk about the violence that we've faced, oh my God, uh, we're intimidated uh, by um, some um, women who claim to be feminists but believe that we are not part of the equality movement, which and justice movement, which is what feminism is. 
And uh, so there's always those battles that you come up against. But and as a trans woman who's you know had a huge long history of being out and. And they're not going to push me back into the closet. I'm sorry. Never, ever. Um, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to, I feel like this is going to be um, a really like juicy question, <laughs> which is, what do we mean when we say accountability? And how do we create an environment in which accountability is possible? <laughs> We're already giggling just because it's... My <laughs> answer is just no. Like, oh. um, anyone, anyone would like to just take a job at, at this question? I think I can start by um, gently opting out. I think... Um, what I've noticed in the queer community in particular is um, folks say accountability when they mean closure and when they mean I am uncomfortable with your feelings, I would like this to be done now, I want to know which party I can go to, I want to know who I can still go out for brunch with and I would like this to be over, you're being inconvenient for me. Um, and I've, I've noticed that as well, I, I worked um, briefly at the uh, Crisis Centre for Women at SFU and that's the language that I received from uh, high level university administration as well as the substitution of words like restorative justice, which is not your word to use anyway, or accountability for or, um, I've got a lot of cases on the go right now and I really need to close this file so that I can go for the day. Um, and I also don't think, um, for me, just because that I have experienced a tremendous amount of sexual abuse uh, doesn't mean that I'm entitled to prescribe what accountability looks like for anybody. Um, I know what it means sometimes on a good day for myself, uh, and I think I'm much more interested in conversations around access to support because it's something tangible we can offer people. It doesn't shift as politics shift. Um, and the reality, I think, of the world that we live in, and this is one excellent thing that Me Too has really highlighted, is that sometimes there is no accountability. You can build your entire career on the sexual exploitation of women and be rich and successful until the day you die. Maybe you get a little bit shunned at the end of your career and they send you off somewhere, but like accountability might not actually be a tangible goal for the communities that I'm a part of. Um, and I hate to see it thrown at people as, a, as like a impetus to get people to stop talking and I don't want to live in a world where there's one answer to that question. I really don't want a world where one person's accountability becomes the accountability for everybody else because I think that's how we got into this problem in the first place. Um, so I think that's where I like to shift the conversation. And I, I want to be clear in that, like, when we talk about often accountability, we assume that that is something that is automatically associated with, like, the criminal legal system. And as if, like, that it, or, or other, like, institutions with a lot of, like, you know, universities or workplaces coming up with their own sexual assault policies, that we have to rely on, like, a particular institution to be like, oh, check, now this person has been held accountable. Because that's also, we know that that's not real. Right? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm curious, Daly, if you have anything else you want to say. I'm feeling all my feelings right now. So I like, um, so I identify as a survivor of an accountability process that was really violent. Like, actually. Um, because I think there's really, I can like all my hair is standing on it to give you like the front row updates. Um, my body temperature is rising, so I'm going to be a little cautious of how deep I jump in. Um, but I think accountability, there's a lot of questions we need to ask. I think I asked it earlier about like, what are we asking people to be accountable for? Like, if it's only about individual interactions, I don't know what future we're building. But I think also it's a question of like, what is the purpose of accountability? Is it to repair or is it to harm? And like, I think often people in their really valid need to be recognized for the things they have survived are actually looking for someone to, to pay, you know? And like, the question is, is accountability, I want them to pay for what they did or 
I don't want them to ever do it again to anyone else. And those are very different questions. And I'm never going to tell you that you shouldn't feel the first way. Like, heck no. But I think in Adrienne Marie Brown, who's an incredible queer black activist in the States, writes about that, like, no matter what you've survived, you don't have the right to do harm to your perpetrator. You have the right to say, hell no. I'm not going to engage with you. But, like, you actually don't get to reinforce harm. And so for me, I would love for accountability to actually be about repair, um, for, you know, safety to be about connections, not isolation. You know, and I think for so many of us as survivors, we make ourselves safe by removing all the threats possible when we can. And we end up being really isolated and don't feel particularly safe. So like, what would it mean for accountability to be about as many connections as we could have that were about safety, um, that were about actually holding people, right? Like to hold someone to account, think about that even like, I don't understand, metaphor, is that what that is? I don't know what it is. Like the gesture of like, how do we bring people in to say like, you can't do that. And, and we want this to change. Um, but yeah, most of the time in my experiences, we don't actually have the internal resources or support, and I think that's where Leah was pointing to support is so integral. Um, and we also think that it's gonna like happen in one meeting with like a mediator or a friend, and actually like it's gonna be an ongoing process of like community, not interaction between two people. Um, but I'm a skeptic, which makes me sound, then I, that like my heart dropped. <laughs> Can I just add something quickly too? I just wanted to speak to um, the point you mentioned from Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, and I love and respect her work so much and I also think it's important sometimes to um, recognize that there's a, a line where that work stops. I am deeply informed by my cultural perspective at this moment, I should just own it. So I'm Jewish and we have an obligation to respond to things like that around, you absolutely never, ever, ever, ever get to harm someone just because they've harmed you, unless they are trying to kill you. Um, and I think the only, the only reason I bring this up is because this was so salient in the work I did in university institutions where Me Too and the work around sexual violence is being framed as uh, like an undergraduate freshman made a mistake because he was never actually equipped with the tools to talk about consent and what I've noticed um, and what's really challenging in, in my community for queer and trans survivors in particular but also women of color is they forget that sometimes they're trying to kill you like sometimes somebody really wants you to die and that's why you're being sexually assaulted I've had to have this conversation with so many counselors at a university level being like you forget that sometimes sexual violence is like a stop along the way in the spectrum of violence that you might experience. And so I notice a real split in the discourse, whatever that means around people who um, are talking about sexual violence as someone who um, made a mistake and someone who we can hold accountable and say, please don't ever, ever, ever do that again and set up some sort of system. And then the people out there who just really, really, really in particular want women of color to die. I think it's just a, a thing that's important to name. Thank you. Um, I know, you know, we're kind of having this conversation and I, I know that when I was asking, like, what do we mean by accountability? That it was going to be a, like, how do, we, how do we even start this conversation? Um, and I remember, you know, sort of one of my uh, also biggest learnings through this um, Me Too movement was... It, obviously highlighting the importance of accountability, but um, how it can be really impossible actually to hold someone accountable. Um, and I remember the learning being like, we actually can't force someone to be accountable. We can only create an environment in which accountability is possible. And so just, I wanna kind of throw that question back to us. It's like, what would be, what would need to happen in order for accountability to be even possible and particularly for like communities that have been historically and ongoingly being criminalized by um by our systems oh that word accountability which is very very difficult i know when i testified at the national inquiry uh, for uh, 
missing and murdered women and girls, indigenous women and girls, and 2S uh, LGBTQQIA. There, I got the whole al alphabet in. And, um, and which was shocking to me was that for the hearings to take place in the different provinces, and in BC here, the BC Liberal Party, which we know is a right-wing party, uh, forced upon the commission that they could not hold hearings here and, um, at, unless they agreed that they would not find any findings of misconduct, which really, really let uh, a lot of people off the hook. And, and so, um, you know, we have to change things like that, but I think with the report uh, or the calls for justice that have come out of the National Inquiry that um, there's where accountability lays now. But we have to do our part. I think most of us in this room do not want to see the conservatives come into power, but we're also struggling whether we believe that the prime minister will really bring concrete action either. So, so remember, just use your vote wisely uh, in October. And, um, you know, in the riding I reside in, and we've had a, a woman of color who's been there forever, but she's just become a, a place sitter and, uh, uh, for a party, and she's forgotten what got her into politics in the first place. So she doesn't want to hold herself accountable. So we have a chance to hold her accountable and say, you know, time to go away, Hetty Fry. <laughs> and, and I admire and respect her for what she's accomplished in life. So I'm not trying to be mean, but, but we do need renewal. We need change. We need, uh, we need people that aren't just going to give us lip service, that they're actually going to take concrete action so we do we need the change makers that have shown through their actions what they're about thank you I, I, Jamie I think just to your point about like when we can't even hold our like systems or prime minister or politicians accountable it becomes such a hard conversation when we're trying to then like just reenact accountability within smaller communities. And the way I see that also play out is like if we can't rely on the criminal legal system or, you know, like heads of states or whoever to even be accountable, um, then what we see is like really trying desperately to hold people accountable in our communities by sometimes canceling people or you know sort of disposing of people who have maybe harmed but also have done other kinds of work in our communities and i'm just curious like how do we how do we do that with how do we hold people accountable without um just wanting to punish and banish people. I'm, I'm gonna latch on to one of the words you used, Sanman. Um, you're such an excellent moderator. Gosh, it's really a privilege to be on a panel with somebody who's just so good at holding space for a really difficult conversation. Thank you for that. Um, the word you used, curious, is um, a part of my own work. I don't like to call it healing work. I'm tired of that word. It's down there with engage and accountable and other words I'm tired of. But I think um, what I'm really curious about is the ways that people who don't have access to what's happening in this room right now, like people who don't necessarily um, talk about feminism or who aren't part of an exciting conversation on Instagram about accountability are doing in their own communities to deal. Um, because that's a community that I came from. Like I am... Um, grew up in a very rural area. I think in a lot of ways, um, urban centers on the prairies are still rural as far as like themes and our access to ideas and what is really academic and what costs a lot of money to learn. The internet has changed and I don't live there anymore, so I might be wrong, but um, I never said accountability. I didn't talk about holding people responsible or wanting to punish people. I was like, hey, you know what? I think I probably shouldn't marry this woman because I think she wants to beat me. Like, what's that about? Huh? 
we should probably talk about that. Anybody else in here being beaten by their wives? Like, what's going on? Um, so those are the people who I'm really interested in hearing strategies from because I think um, it's just really real in a way that we can't hide behind like a veneer of language around like saying accountable or like talking about circles and that kind of stuff. It's another non-answer to your question, but I'm excited about the possibilities of the non-answers at this point. Anything you want to add, Daly or Jamie? Um, um, I don't have an answer, because I don't think there will be an answer. I think there will be, as Leah's pointing to, like all these ways that in these different places people come to do this work. Um, and I do think that we need to be doing this work not at just at the point of crisis, and that the conversation has to happen not at just that moment where we're trying to keep someone safe, or as Leah brought up, and thank you, like we're trying to keep someone alive. Um, that feels too late. And I know like Mia Mingus was in town to talk about transformative justice, and then one of the, like everything stuck because she's amazing at what she does, but she talked about this curve, right? And how there's like a lot going on through this whole process and it's really just in this peak that we respond when we see like violence in front of us and so for me let's not think of like i think the solutions for accountability don't come in response they come in like the day-to-day -day ways that we do things together um and the ways that we build connection and the ways that we yeah i don't think I don't think we can have that form of accountability if it's only considered as a thing we do after a specific act of violence. Anything you want to add, Jamie? Oh yeah, I just wanted to say, I think, you know, we're always expected that it has to be us um, <laughs> to uh, hold others accountable, but um, we can use our actions and, um, the West End Sex Workers Memorial that I co-founded with the fabulous Dr. Becky Ross at UBC, I think is stands as a testament to, to the resiliency of our community. And that, um, that uh, memorial monument uh, symbolizes the people forevermore have to be accountable. Thank you. Yeah. We'll keep pushing for that. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, sort of w w we are talking about um, this sort of what feels like an impossible task <laughs> sometimes to hold people accountable. And Dilly, you brought up such a good point about like, how do we not wait until we see like acts of violence to then talk about accountability? But that like, how do we create more like community accountability so that we're all actually out there pushing and changing social norms or like beliefs that we have about sexualized violence um, so that it's not just you know a few of us or you know feminists in this room who are having who are being tasked to hold people accountable, right? So, just with that, you know, before we um, wrap up our conversations, and I want to leave a little bit of time just in case there's any questions or comments from the audience. Um, how do we how do we look forward? What's after this Me Too movement? How do we carry this forward? Um, what are your thoughts on that? You were talking about we having questions. Did you mean now? Yeah, yeah. Because I was going to talk to, like, it was brought up that, that she was told, well, why are you talking about that topic? You're not a woman. Well, <laughs> if they don't think she's a woman, why would that matter? Because, you know, if you remember the, the well-known quotation is, am I my brother's keeper? Well, you can, you can update it and say, am I my sister or brother's keeper? Yes, you are. 
Not all the time, but sometimes. Like for example, if they're under attack, if their rights are being taken away from them, or if they're being disrespected. So whether or not they care to acknowledge that she's a woman, just being a human being means that she has the right to defend someone else's rights. And I, I especially feel strongly about that one. Uh, uh, and so when we talk about accountability, accountable to whom? We should be accountable to ourselves. That's why we have a conscience. Well, that's wrong what I did. I should amend my behavior. I should let that person know how sorry I am, all those things. Unfortunately, all human beings are not created equal. They're not all like that. So then, shouldn't there be, though, some, some accountability in some way? Yes. For example, Canada is not alone in, in being a country where if a woman is doing a man's job, the employer is allowed to pay her less because she's a woman. As far as I know, I, I'm not up to date, I don't go online, but as far as I know, only one country in the world, now it may be because they're Northern Europe, when it's cold, your brain smartens up, <laughs> but in Iceland, they recently passed a law it is illegal to pay a woman less than a man for doing the same job. So, so if we want progress most of the time, we have to look to somewhere like Northern Europe because we don't get it here, right? <laughs> and so the other one is if, if, you, if you really are your brother's or sister's keeper, what helps is listening to your own self, hoping that you have a guilty conscience. But you know what, what is required in most instances is a simple quality that does not seem to be learned behavior. Empathy. Now, empathy, it helps. If you've been treated badly in the past, it, it helps if you're the person who's remembering that felt so badly that I'm not doing it to anybody else. That helps. Or you can relate it to when somebody else is being treated in a similar way. There's your empathy. But we, we also know that in society we have people who have never suffered poverty, but they have empathy for the poor people and can relate to it. For example, so it, it's 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 not always it's not always learned from experience. Sorry, look I at Warren Buffett. He said a few years ago, billionaires should be paying more tax. I would be happy to pay more tax, and it's disgraceful that my secretary gets to pay more tax than I do. Well, guess what? I don't know anything about Warren Buffett, but lately it said that he had some kind of uh, a lunch and an auction where they raised millions for people living in, the, in, 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 in what they call, what they call it, they have another, but it's like BC housing. Thank you. I just want to... Oh, I, I would just like to we'll finish with the panels yeah. and then we'll come back to the... Uh, there any, was there anything that um, folks on this panel would like to... Uh, just on how we look forward in this movement. Was there anything you would like to add before we open up to the floor? I'm pretty comfortable with what I've said. Um, and I think, I think the work is the everyday work. Um, and it's the like, grand scales and the micro scales. Um, and I think it's a diversity of work. Um, I don't think it's inclusion work. I think it's centering work. Um, but I like, I think the way forward is in a multitude of directions with a multitude of people and not um, any monoculture of, of future is uninteresting and violent to me, so. 
I guess the only thing I would add is further to the point that you made originally, Daly, which is that the like the true origins of the Me Too movement aren't actually mine to prescribe. So um, what I would really like to see is is Tarana Burke call that because my worry is that as this continues to get swept up, like at any point, is there any money actually going back to this woman, like the amount of work that she's done to kick this off? How is that actually coming back to her as far as like even the origins of the hashtag and the intellectual property? I'm really um, like as far as how to look forward with that particular incarnation of the movement, that's hers. And I hope that she's, you know, paid more than more than her due for that, like actually physically money with stuff like let her be so successful and just get to retire never have to do anything else in her life forgetting to start that um and then i think as far as that particular incarnation i'm interested in getting out of the way because it's not really my work to do like i don't even see a place for queers to come in and say you know this this was excluding us because like you were saying the work is happening in different ways um and it's a matter of keeping at it and and because it's just it's an like another iteration yes. of the work that we have been doing as communities for a really long time. So I also appreciate you just pointing that out, like how do we, you know, maybe not just try to make space within this movement, but recognize how all of these um, different communities are doing their own work to address sexualized, sexualized violence. Um, Jamie, I was curious if there's anything you want to talk about just in terms of how do we look forward and actually create um, a world where there is no sexualized violence, where it's not possible to think about harming people in that way. Oh, uh, you know, we just have to keep doing what we do, all of us here, and, and just keep reaching out, touching someone, and just um, keep the dream alive that there's no reason why we can't live in a utopia but if anyone's going to make it happen it's going to be us so just ordinary people going through our everyday lives and um and um and that's all we can do thank you um so I, I know we have a little bit of time left, um, so I just wanted to see if um, people have particular questions or also want to um, share some insight about how we look forward. Did you want to? You're talking about violence a lot. <laughs> and I think that one of the things we start have to start doing is looking at economic systems that create situations where um, violence becomes the only response to frustration. Um, and by changing some of our economic systems, breaking down uh, the control of wealth, spreading it out into the, the people, is one of the essential pro one of the essential structures that we have to start breaking down, and that comes with voting. So I want to get back to voting <laughs> in hopes that we can bring in some of the people, like the ones that are coming up in the state, the young people, who are looking for other answers and are not willing to keep the cult the corporate structures which have helped keep us in our poverty. Okay, so I've been informed that we need to wrap up because we need to feed everybody who's in this room. So I just want to thank our panelists, Daly, Leah, and Jamie Lee for being here. Um, I very much appreciated this conversation and I want to thank everybody who's here um, for having taken part in this conversation. And if you want to continue, I'll be around. Feel free to chat me up. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sonman. Thank you very much. So just before we, we break for lunch, I just invite um, our elder Sequalia up to come and do her work.
Pushing the button and it's on. Wow, that's a first that I'm not heard in the back. Since I have a mic on, I will say that I'm um, talking about words and whatnot. I've lately been saying, when I was young, I was an Indian. Then as I became a teen, I was a native. Then I became an Aboriginal. And now, apparently, I'm an indigenous. <laughs> and so I used to do openings and say, I'd like to welcome you all to our Indian, Native, Aboriginal, Indigenous <laughs> lands. <laughs> and then say, I'm Skohotmish Stalmuk. And that means I'm a Squamish person or human being and that's who I am so I just had to share that as I listen to people talking about words and I welcome you to our unceded territories of the Skohotmish Okamayok, Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam. It's an honor to be with my young relative from Musqueam and I'm going to do Sequalia's song again and um, we're going to bless the food together. And for those who weren't here the other days when I've asked us to Chen Chen Dwight, stand and work together to hold each other up and support each other with prayer because we're medicine for each other. I'll ask you to rise. Those who are, can't rise will just stay seated, but keep your hands open. I'm going to use you for my drum to unclasp your hands because in that way Kakakonic's energy unclasp your hands or I'm going to use you for a drum unclasp your hands do not have your hands like this because our elders say the creator Kakakonic sends energy down through the top of the head through our bodies and I, you need to be open. And this isn't religious. This is our traditional spiritual ways. So I ask you just to keep yourself open and pray for all of our family and friends and for the food we're going to eat. And Unchomo, Shkwalawen, one heart, one mind. I believe my brother Tatetin was here yesterday and he says, not Sama Ishkwalawan. One heart, one mind. Same phrase, two different languages. So we'll now all we'll come together and say that.
Tomika Kakanak Chesiam, Yons Yonso, Tenoyap and Manman, to squiles to seats, asking the Creator to watch over and guide each and every one of your children gathered here, here today. Prayers, Kakakonic, to for all our family, for the unborn Skakal, the unborn babies, for the babies in Munman, parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents for their well-being. Prayers for all our families with serious illnesses, especially those many forms of cancer that are impacting many families these days. Heart problems, diabetes, HIV, and tuberculosis and others, any serious injuries and surgery for their health, healing, and recovery. Prayers for all of our family and friends who are battling drugs and alcohol, and for those incarcerated because of their addictions, and for their families who love them and don't want to lose them. Here are prayers to help them find that path to healing and recovery. Prayers for all of our families who have lost loved ones and feel that pain in their heart to know it goes away and your loved ones always with you. Kakakonic asking for today's meeting that's going to be the closing of today that we, um, it goes well and put special blessings on the food that we're going to be sharing for the ones who prepared it put that nourishment in it for our um, bodies as well as for our hearts and minds to be energized for the rest of the day, especially when we get to hear um, Jody come in to share with us this afternoon and the others that will be doing work. So put that blessing on the food creator and asking all our ancestors to be with us always. And you can sit down and then um, waste gate shed eighth Let's go eat.